You're someone with a vision for your practice, for your side hustle, and for your personal journey. But when it comes to establishing your path on how to get to where you want to be with your practice, things get a little messy. You're also someone who'd prefer to go in person instead of to groups and listening to everyone else's story. To me, it sounds like you could benefit from one-on-one consulting with our experienced practice of the practice consultants. From $5.95 a month and up, you can work with a consultant that will give you more direction and practical tried and tested tips matched to you and your goals. For more information, visit practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanok, session number 932. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice Podcast. I am so excited that you are here with us for the series. We are interviewing seven-figure practice owners, and when I put this out onto just my personal Facebook page in September, uh, I thought to myself, you know, I might get a handful of people. We'll have a small series. But we had almost 20 people reach out to me, some of my favorite therapists in the world that I've known over the years, that have come to events, that um, just have been in my communities or, you know, a part of some part of practice of the practice reached out and said hey i want to be interviewed uh and so we're going to be doing this throughout december and then whichever ones we can't fit in december we're doing at the beginning of the year we're doing new year new habits for a couple episodes then we're going to dive back into some of the million dollar practices so i'm so excited to have dr elizabeth carr with with us today elizabeth is the founder of kentland's psychotherapy and started the practice in 2015 after spending six years as a navy clinical psychologist elizabeth is married with an only child who's a freshman at georgia tech and her practice is now 21 clinicians two admins and two therapy dogs elizabeth welcome to the practice of the practice podcast hi joe thank you for having me i'm so excited to be here Absolutely. You know, I love that you include your therapy dogs in there. The very first place where I was a 1099 contractor uh, with Dr. Larry Beer, they had five therapy dogs and it was like a Pixar movie. Uh, There was this gigantic dog named Zipper who was just like looked like a bear. There was this little wiener dog that was like the most hyper ADHD one. There was this lady or this dog, Stella, who walked around and was a poodle and was like a narcissist. And like each one, like kind of (laughs) identified as like a certain thing people were coming to therapy for. And it was just like, uh, it was hilarious how these dogs just seemed like they were part of their own, their own treatment uh, diagnoses. So uh, have you always had therapy dogs as part of your practice? No. In fact, uh, just a few years ago, my family decided to adopt a rescue dog. And, you know, sometimes rescue dogs can be a little neurotic. And this poor thing had tremendous separation anxiety. And so uh, I started reaching out to my patients saying, would you mind terribly if I bring my dog to work? I promise it'll be temporary. We're doing separation anxiety treatment for the dog, you know, seeing a behavioralist and everything. And uh, within a few months, the treatment was successful and I was ready to start leaving him at home. And I'd say to patients, okay, Riley's going to stay at home now. And they would be like, no, we love Riley. And so we kind of backdoored into it really. It was never an intentional plan. Uh, but he's been so very popular that uh, I've seen the light on the value of it. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Um, my partner, Claire, she has a rescue dog and uh, it's it's funny. Izzy took a while to warm up, but now that Izzy has warmed up to me and the girls, it's it's so fun when she comes in the house. She runs around, yeah. finds the girls and like feels such attachment. And um, it's just so fun to have a, a dog in our house. Yeah. And they say with the rescue dogs, you don't really know their personality until you've had them for several months. And it's so true. Because mm, they're kind of protecting themselves or why yeah, do they say that? The, it, I think it takes them a little while to warm up to you and to get to know you and get comfortable with the new pack. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you can see that in your experience with Izzy. Ah, oh, so awesome. Well, I want to go back before you had a seven figure practice when you were yeah. starting your practice. Um, what did you do at the beginning? This is a question that I just asked Christy, uh, the person right before you. And I think that it's a good place to start. What did you do at the beginning, even if it was accidental, that you're so thankful for that positioned you to have a seven-figure practice? 
Yes. So, you know, just like backdooring it into having uh, animal assisted therapy, I backdoored into having a group practice as well. It never really was my intention. I always just assumed I'd be one of those solo practitioners. But uh, one day uh, someone asked if they could have coffee with me. They were moving to the area and they wanted to hear about private practice. And I liked her so much. I said, hey, Krista, why don't you just join me at this practice? And she said, yes. And then uh, I was sharing cases with someone who saw teens. I only saw adults and she was awesome. And I adult parents of her kids would say, oh, Nicole is amazing. And so finally I said, hey, Nicole, why don't you join us? And then, you know, you wake up one morning and you think, oh, I, I guess I own a group practice. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like I did that way, too, where I was doing supervision with this guy, Steve. And he's like, you know, I just want to make some extra money outside of my full time job. Can I join yeah. your practice? And I'm yes. like, I guess I got to get a 1099 contract <laughs> and figure this out. And how right. am I going to pay you? And it same yeah. sort of thing. It, it wasn't like, yeah. ooh, I want to have a group practice, but it just kind of started. So so kind of just allowing things to unfold. Sounds like you did that early on and, and it yeah. was helpful. Now, when you were maybe around six figures, you know, one hundred thousand dollar practice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that jump from that to a seven figure practice is a big jump, tons of shifts. You can bootstrap your way to six figures. It's really yeah. hard to keep bootstrapping after that. What did you start outsourcing? What did you start um, maybe putting more time into? Like, how did you shift your time around as you went from it being mostly Elizabeth doing everything to, you know, really making sure that this was a genuine business you were building? Absolutely. I think one of the things that's really important is that, um, I started thinking in terms of commoditizing my time. You know, unfortunately, the downside of that is when you say, oh, I could bake a loaf of bread, but that's a $400 loaf of bread now, right? Mm. And similarly, I realized I should not be doing accounting. I should not be doing bookkeeping. I don't need to do those things. I could pay someone else to do it and see another patient and easily pay for it. And so I think many of us, that's one of the first things that we realize is we need some office assistance. Uh, because it makes it scalable. Until you do that, you're always going to be stuck under a, a, a shelf, a ceiling. Yeah. And, and what did you do when you talk about people helping in the office? Um, yeah. Were there key tasks you wanted? Were there certain values you wanted? Like, how did you think through that? Or how have you thought through that? Well, you know, I, I think one of the things is I like to just lead with what do I hate to do? Let me get that away. <laughs> Let me follow my joy. Let's do what I'm good at and creativity and people and things like that. And the things that I don't like, like the bookkeeping and the uh, accounting and the dealing with the, uh, the tax people, I gave all that away. Uh, and that was really, really powerful. That freed up a lot of time to do other things. The other thing I think that's really important is if you're going to have a group practice, you cannot be busy all the time seeing your own clients. You've got to have a balance between seeing clients and having time to really have a leadership role. Mm, yeah. Now, I know you spoke at Killing It Camp about how you don't have to niche. And a lot of you know consultants and people say, find your niche, you know, specialize. It's Absolutely. easier to find people. And you had a great presentation kind of walking through that. And I would love for you to kind of revisit some of those topics with us of how you built a seven figure practice without having to have as much focus on specialization. Absolutely. You know, you said at the beginning that we have 21 clinicians, 21 clinicians and one building in the suburbs who don't specialize and who don't take insurance, I think is a heavy lift. And yeah. the way that we did that was, um, I think, first of all, there's a lot of advantages to not uh, becoming a specialist. The, the advantages are really obvious, right? One of them is that everyone just assumes you're an expert. If you call yourself the Eating Disorder Center of Maryland or the ADHD Center of Chesapeake or whatever, people are going to say they must be the experts on ADHD. They must be the experts on eating disorder. You have immediate uh, respectability. Uh, but there's a lot of downsides to it at the same time. One of them is that uh, your clinicians have a risk of getting burnt out seeing the same homogeneous population all the time. And you hire someone who's awesome at that, and five years later, they're like, eh, I don't really feel like doing eating disorders anymore. They're going to leave your practice because they can't really shift. Uh, I want therapists to come and love it and stay for the rest of their career. And to be able to change your specialty, to not see the same people all the time, uh, to also not feel like you're competing in-house with other therapists. If you all see eating disorders, then there's a sense of, am I going to get my fair share of referrals? But if you're the only one doing PCIT, if you're the only one doing internal family systems, then you're going to have a sense of security 
in your caseload mm. and be able to shine as a specialist. And people really love that. So what does that look like when you or your team is doing new hires for therapists? You know, what does that interview process look like uh, if you're not looking for specific specialties or maybe you are noticing trends? Like just take us through yep. what that hiring process looks like. So when I started the practice, I only saw adults and Krista only saw adults. And when I wanted to invite Nicole to join the practice, she saw teens. And uh, so we're now expanding our age group service line. Uh, and we did that for years. And then new people came on that saw teens. And people would call wanting to have children seen, younger children. And we'd have to give it away. And I felt like it was just like opening a window and then just throwing buckets of cash out the window. Because you're referring all these people who came to you for your good name and you can't serve them. So you say, oh, well, I think I want to hire someone that sees children. And then people want to do couples therapy. I, and I don't have time. I'm doing leadership. So I better find some more people to do couples therapy. And people want med management. Let me find someone that does med management. So I think it kind of organically grows when you see the holes that you are not filling and sending out the door. Mm, yeah. Now, you mentioned a few things you know, in regards to doing leadership and kind of leading the company. Talk a little bit about that, because I think the average clinician, they go to grad school, they you know love the idea of helping people. They love the idea of human development and becoming a better person and overcoming challenges in a marriage or whatever the things are. They start a practice, um, operations and the leadership of the practice may not be the first thing they think of. But then oftentimes, as we have successful practices and do good work, we level up into a six or seven figure practice. And those leadership skills that maybe we've never even been taught, we may have done it in you know different groups or been leaders in different ways, um, aren't always the first and foremost thing we think of. And so for you, what has leadership development looked like? What's been helpful for you in reframing yourself as a leader, not just as a clinician? Like, how did that transition happen? So, you know, you said before that uh, before I started private practice, I was in the military for six years. And uh, one of the things the military does a good job of is teaching leadership skills. I went to a basic officer leadership uh, program, and uh, they said to us fresh-faced officers, what is the primary responsibility of a naval officer? And we all looked dumbfounded and silent. Nobody really knows the answer to the question. And they said, it's to take care of enlisted people. That's mm -hmm. your job. And that really hit me like a sonic boom and I have uh, I've really kept it and I think one of my responsibilities is to make sure that all of my clinicians are full and also that they're not burning out so I'm hustling to make sure we have enough referrals coming in so that everyone has economic security but I'm also saying hey I see that you have eight people in a row on a Saturday repeatedly maybe we should block one of those hours in the middle of the day so you have a breather both of those ends of the continuum are my responsibility, mm. just as an example. No, I think that's great. Like the idea of just taking care of people to be those eyes and yeah. ears and to, to know enough also that it looks like you're headed towards burnout. Uh, let's have a conversation. Um, right. So important. Now, as a seven figure practice owner, what are some challenges you deal with now that, um, either other seven figure practice owners might be dealing with, or maybe they could be unique to you. And then how are you working to overcome those challenges? So one of them is that, uh, we, uh, we were using a building that we rented and I really wanted to purchase it, had a chance to do so. It's a three story building and I have been using two floors. We were about to move into the third floor and occupy the entire building. Uh, and so I'd like to fill it with clinicians. I'm not sure what, uh, how much I can have a density of therapists in one place in one suburban neighborhood before we go beyond what uh, saturation point. Uh, so one of the challenges is to make sure that everyone is busy as they want to be and to say, okay, I hired a, a new person for medication management for years. My husband, after he retired from the Navy, uh, who's a psychiatrist, for years, he was doing medication management for us only for the people who are our therapy clients. So everyone that called, we said, we don't do freestanding medication management. Well, now we do. Mm -hmm. And so I have to figure out a way to undo all that messaging for 10 years of telling people we don't do freestanding medication. Now we're changing the channel and saying, yes, here we are. We can help you. Uh, and that's my job. That's my job to figure out how to undo that messaging. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when you think through that, do you think through hiring someone to help with that messaging? Or is that something that you do your own education on? Like, how much do you still kind of bootstrap and figure it out yourself and take that leadership? And how much do you figure out how to outsource when you have something like that? You know, I pretty much done all of that myself. I like it. I think if people don't like it, they should hire someone that knows what they're doing. Um, but I've been pretty successful so far doing it myself. And so I just lean into, I'll figure it out. Um, I think also I live in a, and our practice is in a new urbanist community, kind of like the Truman Show. And so <laughs> even though we are in the suburbs of DC, it's also kind of like a small town. Um, and so uh, I purchased an electronic, uh, electric replica of a Ford Model T, and I plastered the name of our uh, practice on the side of it and I drive it as much as I can in the neighborhood. It's like, a are you kidding me? Oh, that is so hilarious. Fun. I love that. It's <sighs> so fun. Um, and this year we were asked, there's a Kentlands Lakelands 5k that has about 4,000 people in attendance between runners and volunteers and observers. And they called us this year and said, would you be the pace car? And I was like, hell yes, I'll be the pace oh car. Oh my gosh. Like <gasps> so fun. But yeah, I think it's these, amazing. And these opportunities to be creative it was just, just this last weekend, the neighborhood had an Oktoberfest. They have about 8,000 people that come to Oktoberfest. And I had a neighbor who's a, a carpenter build for me a life size version of that Lucy stand where it says psychiatric help five cents. The doctor <laughs> is in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we uh, we passed out swag. We had a raffle. We gave away Snoopy stuffed animals and things like that. And we wanted to talk about sand tray therapy. So we brought one of our sand trays out and it was filled with little uh, Snoopy uh, cake toppers to kind of replicate how sand tray therapy might look. And uh, just talk to people and connect with the community. We, I think that kind of creativity and that sense of uh, community spirit has really served us well. We do a ton of sponsorships. We sponsor playbills for high school plays and uh, swim teams and uh, larger events and and just to destigmatize mental health and to get the word out about us and have exposure. All of that, I think, has been really worked for us. Yeah. As a therapist, I can tell you from experience that having the right EHR is an absolute lifeline. I recommend using Therapy Notes. They make billing, scheduling, note taking, telehealth, and e prescribe incredibly easy. Best of all, they offer live telephone support that's available seven days a week. You don't have to take my word for it. Do your own research and see for yourself. Therapy Notes is the number one highest rated EHR system available today with a 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot.com and on Google. All you have to do is click the link below or type promo code Joe on their website over at TherapyNotes.com and receive a special two-month trial absolutely free. Again, that's TherapyNotes.com and use promo code Joe on the website. If you're coming from another EHR, Therapy Notes will also import your demographic data quick and easy at no cost, so you can get started right away. Trust me, don't waste any more of your time and try Therapy Notes. Just use promo code Joe at checkout. Well, how do you think through what you're going to invest money into? Like, is it, we don't care, we just want to do awareness building, we want to get our name out there, like we're not looking at ROI, or are, are you looking at, okay, you know, by sponsoring the baseball team, we got two clients, you know, doing this run thing, we got three clients, like, are you, right. how are you yeah. thinking through ROI? Yeah. Or are you not even thinking about ROI? I definitely think about it. Definitely think about it. You know, one of the things is that if the agenda is to help us as a business, but also to destigmatize mental health, it cannot be a secret sponsorship, right? So we're not going to sponsor things that it's not uh, well advertised that we gave them money, whether it's a playbill in a high school play where we can put an ad in there. I love the swim team because they put everyone's logo on the back of the t-shirt. And I think every time mom or dad is washing that t-shirt, they're looking at our logo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's over and over and over again. To me, that's a good investment. Um, so absolutely. How many people are going to see it? How visible is our logo going to be? We are currently going to sponsor a neighborhood, uh, Boo Bash for Halloween, and we are the only sponsors. And every time they advertise, it says generously sponsored by Kentland Psychotherapy. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's the kind of thing that seems to me to be a good investment. 
Yeah. Have you made any bad investments that you don't mind sharing? No, I don't mind at all. Um, you know, sometimes we get calls in the past and somebody will say, we have these little magazines, free magazines that we put in every country club in the area, put an ad in here. We've never gotten returns really on that kind of thing. And uh, so we stopped doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do something like that, do you have like a unique landing page or your phone number? Or how are you tracking if, if you get a conversion from that? So uh, when we do the uh, intake call, we just ask people, how did you hear about us? Would you mm -hmm. remember how you... Now, that doesn't always work because sometimes people have to see your name a few different places a few different times. Um, but we do not... I haven't been as sophisticated as having the, one of those URLs that goes to a specific landing page that tells me, oh, that was from that ad in that magazine. It's, it's much looser than that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just ask people. Yeah, and then when, when, you, when the intake coordinator asks people, where do they put that information? So we're tracking it, and then we sit down periodically and look at it, eyeball okay. it, see what cool. jumps out. Yeah. No, I think it's good to just kind of think through how different folks understand their marketing money. And, you know, sometimes it's we yeah. just want to get our name out there, and we don't need to track anything. We just want to get the name of the practice <laughs> right. out there. And other times right. it's like, yeah, we, we want to look at the swim team. They, they put it, uh, this or the boobash, and I think that's yeah. awesome. No. Yeah, the other thing, if I can just say one more yeah. thing about that. Um, when COVID hit, uh, we uh, applied for PPP money because like many people, our phones completely stopped ringing at first. And you can look at Google Analytics. And one of the things that's so fascinating was that I could tell that half of the phone calls that came into our practice were coming from people tapping the call button on Google, not the call button on our website. Mm. Uh, and I think in part that's because we have like a 4.9 star rating on Google with 39 reviews, I think. Um, and so those Google reviews are extremely valuable and they don't cost you anything. Yeah. Uh, and this is a controversial topic because you can't ask their clients for reviews. But you know what you can do? You can speak to a mom's group and then ask the organizer, hey, can you thank me by giving a review about the quality of the talk I did today? Mm. Um, there's so many ethical ways that you can ask for reviews. And I lean into that heavily because I know how incredibly important for our business those Google reviews are. That's such a smart way to do that. I love that. Um, yeah, because that's always something that people are like, how do I get Google reviews? Sure, I can have colleagues do it. But, you know, other than just asking colleagues and doing sort of like a Google review swap with somebody, what can you do? I love that idea of if you're doing, you know, a talk to you know, maybe even have a QR code, you know, scan this to do a Google review and have it go, you know, from right. your screen or whatever. So that that's really awesome. I, I love that. Now, as you think through your use of time, um, you know, one thing that at least I'm noticing of seven figure practice owners is that they make time for the things that are important, both in their business and in their life, that uh, that they are saying no to a ton of stuff. Um, when you think about your own time, when you think about your boundaries, um, your habits, like how are you thinking through time? What are you saying no to? What are you saying yes to? What's scheduled in on a regular basis? What have you given up? Like when you think about time, what is it that comes to mind for you? Uh, one is be mindful of what you don't feel like doing, but it's important to do. It's very easy to kind of put that in the back burner because you don't want to do it, but it needs to be done. Um, I had uh, agreed to do a sponsorship of a Facebook group that had two posts a year, and I did it a year ago, and it's almost expired and haven't done either of the two posts because I was having a little writer's block on, on what I wanted to say. Uh, but those are the kind of things that if you're, really busy could easily come and go and then you've lost a huge investment so i think having timelines having a tick list uh keeping a balance between um mentorship of staff and marketing and management because again if you like doing one you're likely to lean too heavily into one and neglect something else that's equally important and i think read a lot read a lot of books go to programs like yours, just to make sure you stay on track and to communicate with other people who are also doing the same thing. You know, I went to Cancun for your, uh, one of your programs and it was fantastic. And you just come back rejuvenated with lots of energy to reinvest in the practice. Mm. Now, how are you finding community of other seven figure practice owners? Like who, like, how do you think through your ongoing learning as you, as you level up, there's fewer people at that level. Like, how do you right. make sure you stay current with what other seven figure people are doing? 
Well, you know, again, I think that one of the benefits of organizations like yours is that they're national. I think that there is a scarcity mindset typically with people. And I feel like people are often afraid to connect with other similar practice sizes in their community because they see them as their competition. And so when you can connect with people on a national level, you don't have to be afraid of that. There's no concern that someone's going to take away your clients when they're in Tennessee or Texas or something like that. And so I think that these national opportunities to connect with other people are really solid gold. And you know that generally speaking, the more homogeneous a group is, the more beneficial it's going to be for you. And so when you go to a national scale, you can say, oh, I really want to find another group that's in the one to $2 million range. Mm-hmm. Right, because it doesn't help me to sit around and talk to people that are at the quarter million dollar range or at the ten million dollar range. Those are completely different businesses in completely different places. Yeah. Now um, we're getting towards the end of the interview, but I'm wondering how do you think through your next year or two? Like, what are you considering? Mm. What do you? How do you plan? How do you set goals? Like, what do you do and what don't you do? You know, um, I'm always trying to be thrifty and smart with with how I invest my money. I I created a join our team page for the website. We recently did a refresh on the website and I made a dedicated sub page for each job listing uh, so that I can make it private and public back and forth, depending on whether or not the position is open. Um, And when I did that, all the jobs built within about a year after (laughs) months, you know, everybody's like, it's so hard to find somebody. Yes, it is. But I would argue that rather than spend money on Indeed or Glassdoor or any other place, If you have not done a join our team page and done search engine optimization on your join our team page, you're missing a huge free opportunity to find good quality people. So that's one thing. It just sits there for free month after month. Um, And the other thing is I wanted actually selfishly because our son just left for college and my husband and I got an Airstream and we want to travel more and I can do my job remotely more and more, but now he's doing a lot of men management. So I wanted to hire some other people for med management so that he could transfer cases and be more free to travel with me and not be on the computer all the time doing telemedicine. Um, But also med management people are charging twice as much as your average therapist. So focus on that. Who is the clinician that's going to command the highest uh, salary? Maybe, or fees, maybe we need to be thinking about hiring them first and then the other more junior people that can come later. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I can't wait to hear about your your trip in your Airstream and all the adventures you're going to have. That sounds like it's going to be a blast after living on the road for nine months. There's there's uh-huh. definitely days that I yeah. I miss being able to just say which state should we go to next. Uh, yeah. That was such a, a fun a fun thing to do uh, during COVID. So uh, awesome. Well, the last question that I always ask is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Don't be afraid to stumble into success. You don't have to be an expert on everything. Uh, I'm taking a class right now for uh, CEOs, and they say you can't steer a parked car. And I really like that. You know, just mm. get moving. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, you make a mistake, get up, dust yourself off, keep going. Uh, you will be fine as long as you keep with it. Mm, so awesome. And if people want to connect with you, if they want to learn more about your practice, I know you're also giving away uh, your presentation um, from Killing It Camp. Maybe tell us about that. Tell us about your uh, website and yeah, we'll send people over there. Sure. Okay. So the presentation from Killing It Camp is a deep dive into this question of how to become a very successful group practice without specializing and the pros and cons of specializing and how to do it well. So I'm excited to share that with everyone. I hope people find it really valuable. Um, if you want to follow us, you can come to Kentland Psychotherapy on Facebook, Kentland Psychotherapy on Instagram, uh, Kentland Psychotherapy is our website. Uh, so yeah, follow us, like us, uh, see what we're up to. You can see, uh, you can see the car on Instagram. You can see the, uh, peanuts display on Instagram, uh, all the fun, silly things that we're doing. It's all mm. there out on the cyber world. Awesome. Well, we'll check that out. We'll also link to that presentation in the show notes. So if anyone wants to grab that, you can get that link if you're running or driving right now. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Joe.
Now, I don't know about you, but I already am so excited about this series of interviewing seven-figure practice owners um, to just hear how they're thinking and, you know, over the next, you know, 15, 20 or so episodes for me to be able to just glean all this information from all these amazing people. Uh, it's so exciting. Uh, if you're a seven-figure practice owner, um, maybe you're you're dealing with some of those challenges uh, that Elizabeth talked about. You know, the idea of I want to take care of my team in the same way that you know a naval officer takes care of their team. Uh, where to spend your marketing money? You know, should I uh, worry about saturating the market in having density in one building versus multiple buildings? We have the seven figure practice club that that application just opened. It's a new program. We had enough people that were in group practice boss that were at seven figures that have said, listen, we want something that's just for us. Um, so you can apply for that now over at practice of the practice.com forward slash club. Uh, we're going to be going through those applications in December and January. It's going to be limited to 12 people. We're going to meet once a month for 90 minutes and do three hot seats where we all give feedback to one person for 25 minutes. And we do that three times. We're going to meet once a month where one person presents on something they are just knocking out of the park so that they can get feedback on that, maybe even level up into some consulting. And then we're going to meet live twice a year, once here in Traverse City, and then once at a place that we determined that sounds fun to visit. Uh, and so the 12 of us plus myself will be meeting together for a full year to just help you continue to grow that seven figure practice. So again, you can apply for that over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash club. Also, we could not do this show without our amazing sponsors. Today, Therapy Notes, who is also coming back next year. They've been with us for years and years. They are the best electronic health records out there. Uh, you can get a few months for free if you use promo code Joe at checkout. We have a direct pipeline to their marketing team, to their IT team. Uh, we're doing trainings with them all the time um, to help people have effective billing, effective progress notes, all of that. So if you're looking for the best electronic health records out there, go over to therapynotes.com, use promo code Joe at checkout so they know that their marketing dollars are working and so you can get that discount. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have an amazing day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.